So you have to be a little bit quieter this time because even with the mic, I'm not very loud. So, sorry. So what we were doing, I remember, is we would have, we have some vector field. We have some vector field, let me call it G map, um, which is a mapping from Rn, Rn, which means that in the, could be in space, we have arrows given by, so at each point x in Rn, we attach an arrow g of x. So this gives us some vector field which is just an object. Or we can also think of this as measuring a force, sort of more useful as a force. Um, and then we have also maybe some path. Can't see anything on this picture, but okay. We have some path, yeah. And we can make sense of the line integral of G over the curve gamma, which is, I don't know if it works better with my head in some other place, okay, which is um, the integral of G dx, uh, so we can write it that way. Which is also mean still. What? Okay. Which also means that what we calculate actually, so suppose gamma, which has to be a mapping from R to Rn, so gamma of T, well, I don't know, T is on some range. So let's, uh, oh great, okay, so gamma actually takes T naught, T1 into Rn, right, it's a segment that goes in, and so then we can calculate this as an ordinary integral from T naught to T1 of G of gamma of t, which is a vector, and we dot it with um, the derivative of gamma, which is also an n vector. So both of these are vectors, let me emphasize that. And then we have <coughs> right, so this is the line integral, which gives us a measurement of how this vector field influences this curve as you traverse the curve because this is the tangent to gamma. It's a vector because gamma is a curve, right? I'm seeing some loose looking faces. No? All right. This is what we did last time. And we did a couple of examples of this and blah, blah, blah. And what I ended with is, so let me remind you before what I did ended with, is the fundamental theorem of calculus. In one variable, it says that, well, one version of it, says that if I integrate the derivative of some function, I know this, those are t's. So I have some function, I take its derivative, and I integrate it, then this is the same, so this is if f is nice. Does it say that? 
then this is just evaluate f at each endpoint. So this is what enables us to actually do calculus 2, that we can actually compute integrals rather than having to take those horrible limits of Riemann sums. And really it just comes down to uh, the mean value theorem suitably interpreted, interpret right? I assume everybody knows this. If you don't know this, then you're definitely in the wrong class and you missed at least a semester of stuff. Um, so we want a version of that for these kind of integrals. And the version of that is, so we have some function, let's just continue with g. So I have g taking rn to rn. And suppose that g is the gradient of some function f, where f is a function from r to rn. And I need some conditions on f. Here I just wrote nice. Here what I need is that f is continuously differentiable. Where we're looking, so we have some set u, which is obviously a subset of r. Uh, no. No, no. continuously differentiable on some integral. So, yeah, and so we have also if gamma, which takes some other integral, don't care which one, AB into Rn to the smooth curve, And it's contained in something's wrong here. I see. Well, let's just say a neighborhood. sense. 
sense than the theorem doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is exactly the analogy of that. It's saying, I have, let me draw it in the plane this time. I have some vector field in some region. So I have some vector field here. And I have some curve that isn't icky. So my vector field has to not just be a random collection of vectors. It has to have some nice continuity that when I move around here, the vectors don't just suddenly point the other way. They move in a continuous way. And so that's this continuously differentiable. It means that this vector field actually moves in a predictable way. And then I have some curve going from here to here. That's my gamma. Then it doesn't actually matter what the curve is. It just matters that I go from here to here. So this curve has the same line integral as that curve. Or as that curve. It doesn't matter. So something that you're familiar with where these kind of things happen is, say, in physics, the amount of work that it's going to take me to walk from here to the third floor of this building is the same if I go up this stairwell or I go up some other stairwell. I just have to get from here to there. That's assuming that there's no friction. right? Or the amount of work for me to lift this book from here to here is the same if I do this or if I do this. I still have to fight the same amount of gravity. When I do this, it's not much work. When I do that part, there's all the work. And then it didn't take any work. Right? So that's this condition right here is saying that G has a potential. So in physics terms, which I know this is in the physics class, and so if it doesn't help you to think in terms of physics, it's fine. But this is saying that G has a potential. That is, there is some function that it represents, or there's some sort of quantity here. Another way to think of it, another way, um, it has a potential, let's call it F here. There's some function, so there exists some function F from R to Rn, so that G corresponds to flowing downhill along the graph of F. So I can think of my vector field G if I take some surface, just draw that one. Maybe it maybe it has some bumps and some hills and some valleys. So let's make it a little more complicated. So it has a bump there, maybe it goes down here. my graph F, this is my Rn down here, this is my graph of F, and G corresponds to the gradients, how water would move if I pour water on this surface. And so if I look at this from the top, I have some that's this pump here. Stuff flows down in some way. Corresponds to some flow. And then this line integral is measuring how much work it is to get from one point to another. 
And there's lots of paths up the mountain, but they all take the same amount of work if I start in the same place and end in the same place. So that's what this theorem is saying. Uh, another way of saying that is if G is a conservative vector field, this doesn't mean it's a vector field in a red state that it voted for on the, doesn't mean that. Um, then the line integral is independent of path. So conservative comes from the fact that there is some quantity which is conserved. So if I were to, instead of looking at the flow lines here, um, anyway. What am I doing wrong here? Yeah, instead of looking at the gradient, these gradient curves are so orthogonal. To something that has curves that close up. Right, so if I make the level curves of this surface, the gradient flows across them. Okay? And, and so these are, sometimes in physics language, these are called integral curves. So I have an integral. So sometimes in, in, in physics, or in other cases, they'll just say, this vector field has an integral. That means there's some quantity which is conserved. Um, and I think somebody asked this, me, Jake, I don't know. Somebody asked this last time whether this corresponds to <coughs> Okay, I just forgot what I'm talking about. Okay, good. Corresponds to something, but I don't remember what it is. Fine. So, good question. Okay. So, are we okay with that? So, so this is a, a version of the fundamental theorem of calculus. One thing that's different here is we have this condition. G has to be the gradient of something. It isn't always true. So there are there are functions, there are vector fields which are not gradient. There are functions for which the fundamental theorem doesn't hold. They're really nasty. But it's very easy to construct functions of more variables which are not gradients. So, uh, I guess let me prove this. The proof here is pretty easy. So, we're assuming that this guy, so G is the gradient of some function f, so this is the same. that. Gamma is some curve. So wherever it went, I don't know. Um, this guy, if we're going to actually calculate it, it's an integral from t naught to t1 of the gradient of f evaluated at gamma. So this is a vector dotted with the derivative of gamma the vector. Now this is a one-dimensional integral. Right? So this is, well, maybe it's not clear yet. This is the chain rule for this composition. So that means that this is just the integral of d dt of gradient of f evaluated at gamma of t.
Right? This is just from the chain rule. And now this derivative, I put in a number t, I do some stuff, and I wind up with a number r. So this this function, let's call that um, G 
no, not G. Yes, it is G. G of gamma of B minus G of gamma of A. Which I think is what I wrote over there. It was not, but I should have written. Did I write F? This is, this is why it's wrong. This is why this is wrong. Sorry. F of who is the gradient of what? G is the gradient of F. Yes. <laughs> I don't have 
actually have to do that integral. This should also be equal to this guy evaluated at 0, I mean at 1, minus this guy evaluated at 0. So if you do this integral, you should get 2. Is it 2? Okay, good, thanks. And so this integral is 2. But so is if instead of doing t, t squared, I do something that goes like that, the same. Yeah? Can you explain a little more about like, what a line integral like, represents? So one interpretation is you have this force field which corresponds to the vector field. And the line integral represents the effect of that force field of moving along the path. So when you're moving in the direction of the force, you feel the full force. When you're moving perpendicular to the force, you don't feel it at all. There's no work. So if you think of sailing, right? If you're sailing, it doesn't have to be straight lines. Any path. So it's calculating work. Ish. I mean, and we have to worry about how fast we're going at things. But in fact, we've just shown it doesn't matter for a gradient vector field. So it's, it's summing up the effect of this vector field on this curve. Okay. It only the direction that it's traveling. Like, as it pushes it along the track. Yeah, but it, I mean, you know, if this is the track and that's the force, you're not going to get pushed along there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, you can think of it that way. So it's, it's just a way to measure what that vector field is doing as you move that way. Yeah? So couldn't we just, could we simplify most problems then into just straight lines just to make it easier? Yeah. <coughs> okay. If, if, if it is a conservative vector field. Okay. If it's not a conservative vector field, this is all not true. So, so, um, let me give you an example. So, well, yeah, let me give you an example where it's not true. Uh, So let's, let me give you a very natural example. Let's think of polar coordinates. This is r and theta. And let's parameterize the unit circle as the curve. Um, so the unit circle. Um, just theta. R is 1. Right? So I'm just saying, start here, go around, come back. Now, if I want to figure out the length of this curve, well, it should be 2 pi. But another way I can think about the length of this curve is by adding up the tangent vectors as I go around here, right? Now, if this were independent of path, right, I have tangent vectors here. So I could take a vector field that coincides with the tangent vector. So let's just take a vector field, this vector field, which is just going around in circles. So that's certainly a perfectly good vector field. I'm not calculating anything. I'm just saying we can calculate, though. If this were independent of path, then the arc length on this circle should be 0. Why is that a problem? Well, there's something going on right there. Polar coordinates have a problem at the origin. When r is 0, theta can be anything. 
And so as I traverse this, I can't just pull this curve back to nothing. There's a problem here at the origin. This curve is very different. Right? This curve goes around. And I didn't really think this example through because I wasn't planning to give it. But we can turn this into a real example if you want. But so you can see here, I mean, I can just take this vector field, right? This vector field, so let's write it in x and y. So this vector field is the vector field um, it's not yx. It should be well, is it yx?
So that means that fx, the x derivative of g, uh, no, of right, the derivative portions, the dx of f is negative y, and d dy of f is x. That's just another way of writing that. And now if we take the mixed partials, d dy of d dx of f, then that is negative 1. And if f were, if g were conservative, then that should be um, d dx of d dy of f, which should be plus 1. So negative 1 is not usually the same as plus 1. So so it's easy to check whether your vector field is conservative. You just take the mixed partials, and if they're equal, everything's great. And if they're not equal, then it's not. Um, so in this case, right, if I take the mixed partials, partial of this is 0. I mean, the y derivative of this is 0, the little x derivative of this is 0, 0 is 0. Good stuff. Yeah? Can you explain how that's related to the fact that your energy is conserved, or the other explanation of conservative? So, energy being conserved. How does that relate to the mixed partials? Like means that there is a function. There exists a nice function a well-behaved function, which corresponds to the energy. That's your potential energy. There is a nice <coughs> function that doesn't suddenly jump, or doesn't behave in weird ways. So here, this circulatory vector field here has a problem at the origin. It can't be reconciled when we bring everything down to zero. There's a singularity here that I can't make go away. Or if we take, you know, this guy, right, that one's okay, isn't it? Oops. Forget that one. Um, that one's a problem. Anyway, so if we, right, so that's, that's the same. We have energy, and energy varies in a nice way. If somehow the energy here would change in some horrible way to the energy here, then the mixed partials, then it wouldn't be a nice function about how the energy varies. If we think about this surface corresponding to the energy surface that we're flowing on, then if I go this way and this way, the tangent plane will vary in a different way than if I go this way and this way. So this surface is nasty. I did. It means that there exists a function which your vector field is the gradient of. There is a conserved quantity. Like, I'll just keep the same trace in the same direction. No. Just that if you would think of it as a function, like the gradient of the function would be a vector field. Yes. So we say a vector field is conservative if it is the gradient of something. And, and so, I mean, the word conservative vector field really comes from physics, where there is a conserved quantity, like energy. There's a potential. Yes. I mean, if, if you want, we could say they are, you know, we could say that these are exact forms, but so let's not. Yeah. So if you were to see that in, like, life, does that, would that, like, does that sort of imply that there's something, an outside thing acting on it? Like, if the energy is jumping around because it's not conservative, that would imply like there's friction or something? I mean, it may not have to be energy which is conserved. It could be angular momentum. There's lots of conserved quantities that occur in but, life. But, so there'd have to be something from the outside to make it non-conservative? What outside means. But not typically in physical systems, like, like if you have friction, then, you know, the amount of energy you put in 
won't be the amount of energy that there is altogether, you lose some to friction. Now, if we could crank up a, a dimension where we see how much is lost to friction, then that loss in friction goes somewhere. You know, it, it didn't just go away. The energy just wasn't burned up. It was absor absorbed by whatever was exerting the friction. So if we go up a dimension where we account for that, I see you in just a second. If we go up a dimension where we account for that, then we have it conserved again. Right, so that's where we have you know, potential and kinetic energy. You're trading from one to the other. If we just look at potential, then it's not gradient. But if we have potential plus kinetic, then it is. Okay, yeah? Uh, to see if it's conservative, you can use that test with the mixed partial. Sure. That doesn't work the other way, though, right? No. You can't it. It's possible to construct. Something with the same mixed partial that's not. No, no, the other way around. If you have, if the mixed partials match, then for sure the fundamental theorem of, of, of the fundamental theorem holds. In most cases when the mixed partials match, the fundamental theorem won't hold. But you kinda can sort of. Right? So I mean think about this example. Um, no, it's not gonna quite work. I mean this vector field is not a conservative vector field. But in fact, if I look at this, this is OK, because it avoids the singularity. And so it, it conserves something. So I have to change coordinates, and then it will be this, this potential function, which corresponds to this thing, looks like, I don't know, 1 over that. If you have like a specific parametrized map on the gradient field, then you might be okay, and you might be able to change. Right. In the, in this case, I think this vector field I drew is that one, and this is okay as long as I stay away from both x and y zero. If I don't go around, anyway, I don't want to. So, has anyone done any complex analysis? I don't think so. Right. So there's this, this well-known thing in complex analysis called the Cauchy integral formula, which says that you can do path integrals and you calculate as you go around the singularity. So you have to add up how many, how many poles are inside your curve. It's exactly this problem. But anyway, that's... So the thing that you should take away from this is if we can find a potential, then everything's great. And if we can't find a potential, then we have to work hard. This was much easier, right? So, so in this example, I could have just taken this straight line, or I could have taken that straight line, and it would have been a lot easier to do. OK. Um, yeah, so how would you find a potential? So suppose I tell you, let's, let's take an easy one. G of x, y is x, let's see, x squared plus, does that work? So if I take the y derivative there, I get 2x. Now, wait. If I take the derivative of this with respect to x, that didn't work. <sighs> Crap. Sorry. Uh, you tried y squared there. Here? Yeah. Well, yeah, but that would be. OK, let's do that one. That one's easy. And put. That doesn't work because. OK, so that one works. I really wanted a mixed term, but let's do that. So suppose I have this. This is obviously. conservative since no no it's not let's get squared back here jeez alright this is not conservative ok 
Let's put x squared here, and let's put y cubed there. Let's just do this. This one's easy, and then we'll do the other one. This is obviously conservative, because the y derivative of x squared is 0, which is the same as the x derivative of y cubed. Right? Because this is supposedly the gradient of some f. It's hard to figure out what f is. Yeah. Um, all right. I have to think this a little bit, but what I'm thinking you have to do is so if you integrate the uh, x component of it in the x direction, what you're going to get is a function, or actually, I guess the better way to set it up is you're thinking about the, the nice. You're looking for a certain function, right? Yeah. You know, if you integrate, if you integrate f of x in the x direction, yeah. what you're going to get is uh, that part. So the, the big function you're looking for, you can put in three pieces: a function of only x, a function of only y, and a function of x and y. Okay. So when you integrate the x component, you get the function of x, and you get the function of x y, but you don't get the function of only y. And then when you integrate the y component, you get a function of y and a function of x, y. And then with, with those two equations, you could put them together to find OK. Yeah. So what you said first is also right. But and this is what you said. Yeah. There's some f1, f2, and f3. Right? This has both. OK. So and what you said first was a good way to start. In this case, this one, it'll work, because this it doesn't exist. So that is, I can just integrate x squared dx gives me 1 third x cubed plus a constant. And if I integrate y cubed dy, this gives me 1 quarter y to the fourth plus some other constant. And so that means that my function, that's this part, and this is this part, and so that means that my function, any function of the form, one third x cubed plus one fourth y to the fourth plus any constant will work fine. So there, there's a perfectly valid potential. The thing that you have to keep in mind is that this part might exist. So, for example, if what I was trying to, I thought I wrote one down, x squared x plus xy. Does that one work? So that derivative is zero, that one doesn't work. Uh, uh, so if I take the, x derivative of this, I get y. If I take the x, the y derivative of that. I don't know why I can't do it. Um, yeah, so, so let's take this guy. x squared plus y, y cubed plus x. That one will certainly have the right property because the mixed partials are one. Uh, and in fact, uh, that one should work too. Now the mixed partials are uh, not right. <laughs> I don't know why I can't figure this Wait, out. Wait, why don't you just use the one you're using before, but add on the on the left side of it um, this x y. Uh, the one that you just did, like the first when you started going up there, you had one that in the one direction derived to be zero, and the other direction when you derived it twice was one. And then uh, so okay, so the derivative of this guy with respect to x is three y squared plus x. Three y squared plus y. So here I should have x. No. What? No. I don't know. I I should have y cubed. This is gone. Derivative with respect to x, and this is y. And so here I just want an xy. Xy here. Yeah. And now I'm good. Uh, no, I don't. No, you're 
Uh, no, y squared over 2. Good. OK, that one should work. Derivative of this with respect to y is y. Derivative of this with respect to x is y. So it's certainly concerned. But then take the derivative again. I don't need to take the derivative. This is already a great. Oh, okay. 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 okay, so. So how did we figure out this function? Sorry, I got lost here. How did we figure out this function? So let's pick one of the guys and integrate it. So I'm going to integrate x squared plus y squared over 2 with respect to x, thinking of y as a constant. And I will get 1 third x cubed plus xy squared over 2 plus some constant where this constant is some function of y. And if I integrate the other side, y cubed plus xy dy, then I will get uh, 1 fourth y to the fourth plus, again I'm integrating dy, so I will get y squared over 2 times x plus some other constant, depending only on x. And then these guys match. This part's the same. This is my constant on x. This is my constant on y. Yeah? So they're not really constant. They're, const they're functions which depend only on y. It's constant as far as x is concerned. And this is constant as far as y is concerned. So I'm calling them constants, but it's really functions only on x, functions only on y. In terms of this, in terms of this breakdown, when I integrate in terms of x, this is what I see. When I integrate in terms of y, this is what I see. This is the part that is not seen. This is the part that is not seen by the x, and this is the part that is not seen by the y. Those are the constants. So that means that my potential should be 1 quarter y to the fourth plus x y squared over 2 plus 1 third x cubed. And I can throw on any constant if I feel like it. Uh, I need another letter n. OK? All right. Um, so that is one way that if you determine that a vector field is conservative, you can either just change the path, or you can find the you can find the potential and evaluate. But you don't always, you don't have I mean you don't have to find the potential, right? You can just find change the path so everything is convenient too. That's perfectly fine. They told me they're going to fix these boards. I don't know if I believe them. Um, they told me they know why they're messy. That they mean that they will fix them. Okay, so I'm going to. Are we okay with that? All right, of course I didn't even get to what I wanted to do, but this seems to be the nature of stuff. So, I changed topics a little bit. Let's think about what it means for a curve to be parameterized by arc length, which I thought I had talked about before, but apparently I didn't. So I want to say some words about that. So I have some curve gamma of t, and we know that the arc length well, I don't know if we know this because a lot of people got this wrong on the first exam. But the arc length of gamma is, does anybody know? Yeah, Inter the integral of the tangent vector. Right, so I just integrate. So gamma goes from, I don't know, t naught to t1 is the integral from t naught to t1 of 
channel prime of t length dt. Right? So I have my curve down here. I take all the little tangent vectors. I add their lengths. And it gives me how long the curve is. Which is just saying, another way to say it is you think about driving on this road and you average your speed, your, your speed over you know one second intervals. In one second intervals. Add them up and there you go. Yes, I know. Okay. So there we have that. Now we can think of S, so this is almost always the correct the way that one represents arc length. So almost always S means arc length. Here, I'll put a gamma there for a second. Is going to be, well, if I just do this as a function of T. Mm -hmm. Just take my curve and I run it from, from my start to some time t. This is the distance along gamma after t times. So this will now be a function, which is the distance that I travel. Now, what I'd like to do is I want to rewrite gamma of t as some other parameter gamma of u, where at every point if I take the derivative in terms of the u parameterization vectors that they're always ones, so that in one unit of time, I travel one unit of distance. So how would I do that? Yeah. You divide the tangent vector by the magnitude of the tangent vector? Yeah. And that would give you the unit vector in any direction, right? Right. So now, but I have parameterization. So suppose I hand you, well, let's do an easy one. So suppose I hand you some curve. Let's use a circle. Uh, let's use a circle of radius 2. So this is not parameterized by time by by arc length. I'm off by a factor of two. So this guy has the yeah, prime of t equal two everywhere. But I don't want to just divide gamma by two. What do I want to divide by two? I want to divide t by two. So I'm like, now, um, right, so this original guy traverses the circle of tangent vectors of length 2, and then if I go half the speed, if I go around half the speed, then my tangent vector will be at length 1. Okay, so I want to divide my speed by 2. What if my speed changes? Then I have to work a little harder. So, do you integrate from t on t? I'm sorry? Do you integrate from t on t? And then use that to uh, I would integrate, I would write that, so, yeah, since I'm almost out of time. So the idea is, I want to solve, I want to find S of T, 
as explicitly as an integral, and then I want to invert. Which is, I don't know, uh, so I make 
the substitution u equals 1 plus t. So I get 1 plus t. Um, somewhere I'm off by 1. Oh, yeah. Sorry. 1 plus t to the 3 halves, 2 thirds. Should I be a minus 1? Evaluated from zero to one. Except I'm not going to two. I'm going to t. Maybe I should call it r. Right? Did I do this in a good way? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which is two thirds. I'm gonna call this parameter. I don't know. You. You. I already used. So this is two thirds, one plus u to the three halves minus one. Twice two thirds. Right? That's my arc length at time u. So at time zero, I have two thirds minus two thirds, which is zero. And at time two, I have two thirds times three to the three halves minus two thirds. Okay, so now I'm out of time, but not too much out of time. So now I want to solve this the other way around. Right? So I'm not right. I have S equals two thirds one plus U three halves. Minus two thirds, and I want to solve for u. So, a little bit ugly. Yeah, I never know.